Okay. Um, colleagues, thank you very much for joining us um, this evening for our clinical care platform webinar. Um, today, we are dealing with a topic about the, the treatment of COVID-19. Um, we're going to discuss how to clinically manage patients, but also to discuss if there is a cure. Don't ask me that question. I don't know the answer, but I'm hoping that in the next 60 minutes, we'll know if there is a cure. Just to say that um, these uh, sessions are CPD accredited and uh, with an effort to try to improve um, the flow of information around CPDs. From next week, we will share a new link in terms of registering for these sessions, which would require uh, participants to uh, complete your full names, but importantly, your council um, registration. Um, we are continuing and next week we will have another um, important session around anesthesia um, with, uh, uh, in the context of COVID-19. And I also want to announce that on the 17th of, of September, it's the International Patient Safety Day. Um, and the theme for this year as published by WHO is health worker safety. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll be looking forward to those sessions. I don't want to waste a lot of time, but to welcome Dr. Joshua Segule, who is the head of ENT at Whitbank, but also the lead uh, for COVID response. And he will then introduce today's topic again, together with the uh, presenters. Thank you, Dr. Segule. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Mawela. Um, yet another interesting one. And uh, thank you for the platform that you've created so that we can share information around COVID. I've said it to colleagues before that the challenge with COVID is that um, you don't sit in a classroom and they teach you about COVID. So this kind of platforms, they educate us as healthcare workers. As you know, expected from the public, lay people, they expect every doctor to know about COVID. So now let's continue uh, supporting this kind of platforms and uh, hopefully we can educate better with colleagues. So today we're talking about treatment of COVID-19. The question we're asking is, is there a cure? So as you know that COVID-19 poses challenge to everyone, healthcare workers, patients, families, not knowing whether there's a treatment or not. So this pandemic has taught us to be vigilant in all aspects of life. Lucky enough, we've got beautiful speakers, knowledgeable people today to teach us and to tell us if there is a cure for this disease or if there is ways we can deal with it. To unpack it for us today, they'll be talking about the treatment at home in hospital treatment, non-pharmaceutical treatment of COVID disease, if there is any renal involvement, because we've seen so many people succumbing to renal failure rather than the COVID itself. On my list of speakers today, I've got um, Dr. Roberts, who will be in place for Dr. Zwani, who had a family emergency. Dr. Roberts, she's a comsef who has done uh, MBCHB at University of Pretoria. She's currently part of COVID-19 task team in Whitbank and as the province as a whole. And she's been working in the COVID ward for more than three months. Also in the panel, we've got Dr. Ross, Louise Ross, who's a graduate from University of Pretoria, currently a medical officer in the Department of Internal Medicine for more than 15 years in Whitbank Hospital. She holds an MET, or Masters in Clinical Pharmacology with Investor of Pretoria. She's got special interest in infectious disease and autoimmune disease. Uh, also, we have Dr. Nakaito, who's a graduate from Medunsa, currently known as Sofako Mahato University. He is a specialist physician and as well as a nephrologist by qualification. He's got special interest in rheumatology. He's the current clinical head of nephrology in Spakomakoto University and has been examiner for College of Medicine exams, South Africa for the past four years. 
Colleagues, let's welcome the panelists. And to start off the show for tonight is Dr. Louis Ross with the treatment of COVID-19, inpatient and outpatient. Dr. Ross, can you please share your screen? I'm on it. Uh, there we go, Doc. Thank you, we can see everything you can take us through. Okay. Good evening, colleagues. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been learning at a rapid pace. From testing to immunity and even isolation precautions, this has been a build the bridge as you walk across type of situation. Now, one of the pieces to this bridge is also patient care and the medical management of those hospitalized with COVID-19. Now, this is a, an important slide which basically summarizes what we are dealing with. We have stage one, um, the mild viral phase or early infective phase. Now, the initial stage occurs at the time of inoculation and early establishment of disease. For most people, this involves an incubation period associated with mild and often non-specific symptoms such as malaise, fever, and a dry cough. Stage two, the pulmonary phase or the moderate phase, um, is basically the established pulmonary phase where viral multiplication and localized inflammation in the lungs are the norm. During this stage, patients develop a viral pneumonia with cough, fever, and possible hypoxia. And then stage three, the hyperinflammation phase or severe phase is seen in a minority of our COVID-19 patients. And this is the most severe because it manifests as an extra pulmonary systemic hyperinflammation syndrome. In this stage, we can see shock, vasoplegia, respiratory failure, even cardiopulmonary collapse. Systemic organ involvement, such as myocarditis, would manifest during this stage. Now, a lot of doctors have been asking about antibiotic use with patients that are positive for COVID-19. Now, basically, um, they, they use everything but the kitchen sink approach has been <laughs> deployed during novel and emergency times. Um, and data was collected from 38 Michigan hospitals in America. And out of those 1,705 patients with COVID-19, 56.6% were prescribed early empiric antibacterial therapy. But only 3.5% of those patients had a confirmed community onset bacterial infection. More worrisome is also the use of empirical antibacterials range from 27 to 84% of those patients of advanced age. So that was quite a shocker, only 3% that had bacterial component. Now, um, a quick touch on nutritional interventions that we use for our patients. Um, our aim is not to create expensive urine <laughs> for our patients, but rather evidence-based treatments. And as you can see, each nutritional component has an effect on the treatment. For instance, vitamin C um, is an effective extracellular nutritional antioxidant. So if injury occurs due to an increase in iron, then vitamin C may be an effective quencher of free radicals induced by iron and increasing intracellular zinc with zinc inophores like pyrothion can efficiently impair the replication of a variety of RNA viruses. Now those can be like uh, polio and influenza viruses. So the combination of zinc with this pyrothion at low concentrations then inhibits the replication of COVID-19 in the cell culture. Vitamin B3 or niacin um, in a combination with zinc is imperative for the function of the SIRT1 gene, which decreases the level of tumor necrosis factor alpha and the interleukins 1b and interleukin 6. And vitamin D, um, basically COVID-19 downregulates our ACE2 protein expression with increased inflammation and injury from neutrophil infiltration in the lung from unbalanced activation of the renin and jutensin aldosterone system, also known as our RAS system. So vitamin D appears to be a negative endocrine regulator of the RAS system and can lower RAS 
activity via suppression of renin expression and thus such has a benefit for our patients. Now, anticoagulation. COVID-19 induced hypercoagulability has been demonstrated to play a significant role in our overall COVID-19 outcomes. It should be recognized that lower weight molecular heparin has non-anticoagulant properties that is beneficial in our patients with COVID-19. These include anti-inflammatory effects and inhibition of histones. So a large cohort study of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 revealed an association between administration of in-hospital anticoagulation and survival. So our in-hospital mortality for patients treated with anticoagulation was 22.5% with a median survival of 21 days, compared to 22.8% and a medial survival of 14 days in patients who did not receive treatment dose anticoagulants. So the study found that hospitalized COVID-19 patients treated with anticoagulants had improved outcome both in and out of the intensive care unit setting. The research also showed that the difference in bleeding events among these patients treated with and without anticoagulants was not significant. So, and interestingly enough now, uh, patients um, have an increased risk of thromboembolic events post-discharge. So Brosnan et al. even suggested extended thromboprophylaxis in our high-risk patients upon discharge. For example, these high-risk patients may include a patient that had a D-dimer that had um, that was raised more than twice the upper limit or a patient with an increased CRP more than twice the upper limit, patients aged all, uh, more than 60, and patients with prolonged immobilization. Um, Talking about corticosteroids, uh, this trial I think all everybody recognizes, the recovery trial, which is the randomized evaluation of COVID-19 therapy. And in the dexamethasone arm of this trial, patients hospitalized with COVID-19 were randomized to receive usual care. Overall, it was shown then that 24.6% of patients that were randomized to receive usual care died within 28 days compared to 21.6% of patients who received usual care plus dexamethasone. However, a pre-specified analysis of 28-day mortality by level of respiratory support at baseline showed that there was an absolute reduction in mortality rates of 11.7% in patients receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. So this equates to a number needed to treat of nine to produce one additional survivor at 28 days. Similarly, a reduction of 3.5% was seen in patients receiving oxygen, but not on ventilation at baseline. So this equates to a numbers needed to treat of 29. Um, the REMAP CAP COVID-19 corticosteroid domain randomized clinical trial was published yesterday. I think all over the country, our pulmonologists are all hung over today after celebrating three studies that were published yesterday in JAMA. So the REMAP CAP study basically shows the effect of hydro cortisone on mortality and organ support in patients with severe COVID-19. Among patients with severe COVID-19, treatment with a seven-day fixed dose course of hydrocortisone or shock-dependent dosing of hydrocortisone compared with no hydrocortisone resulted in a 93% and 80% probabilities of superiority with regards to the odds of improvement in organ support three days within 21 days. So basically, what this trial is saying is um, in a 403 patients, um, hydrocort was given. Unfortunately, the trial was stopped early due to other concomitant trials that were going on at the same time, but 93% superiority was seen before this trial was stopped. Now, just to support this, another mm -hmm. trial was <laughs> published yesterday, and this is the CODEX randomized clinical trial. Now, the CODEX randomized trial basically 
shows the effect of dexamethasone on days alive and ventilator three in patients with moderate or severe acute respiratory distress syndrome and COVID-19. It's a randomized clinical trial that include, included 299 patients, the numbers of days alive and three from mechanical ventilation during the first 28 days was significantly higher among patients treated with dexamethasone plus standard care when compared with standard care alone. In other words, 6.6 .6 days versus 4.0 days. Thus, intravenous dexamethasone plus standard care compared with standard of care alone resulted in a statistically significant increase in the number of days alive and three of mechanical ventilation over 28 days. And then the large, largest but biggest study that was published yesterday, it's very, very exciting, was a meta-analysis on the association between administration of systemic corticosteroids and mortality among critically ill patients with COVID-19. So in this perspective meta-analysis of seven randomized trials that included 1,703 patients, of whom 647 had passed away in a 28-day all-cause mortality, was lower among patients who received corticosteroids. Um, in other words, the uh, summary odds ratio was 0 0.66. So administration of systemic corticosteroids compared with usual care or placebo was thus associated with lower 28-day all-cause mortality in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Now, the one thing about corticosteroids and this meta-analysis still leaves a few questions for us clinicians. What is the optimal type of corticosteroid, DEXA, hydrocorts, or methylprednisolone? The timing, dosage, and duration is also still um, in question. So in this meta-analysis published yesterday, researchers say that the mortality results were consistent across the seven trials with dexamethasone and hydrocortisone giving similar effects. Dexamethasone reduced death by 36% and hydrocortisone reduced death by 31%. But there were too few patients involved in test of methylprednisolone to enable researchers to estimate its impact with precision. Only one trial, which enrolled 47 patients of whom 26 passed away, evaluated methylprednisolone. It suggested the drug reduced death by 9%. So this meta-analysis still leaves some questions on the optimal dosage then required for our DEXA. Um, a quick word on tosil, um, sorry, I always struggle to pronounce this, tosilizumab, tosilizumab, there we go. Um, it's a monoclonal <laughs> <laughs> antibody and it's a tongue twister and it's basically directed against the interleukin-6 receptors. So um, this has been proposed to mitigate the cytokine storm syndrome associated with severe COVID-19. Now, very interesting, on the 8th of August this year, Roche provided an update on the phase three Covacta trial of um, a monoclonal antibody in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 and COVID-19 associated pneumonia. Now, basically, uh, the update was, uh, the key secondary endpoints, which included the difference in patient mortality at week four, were not met. However, there was a positive trend in time to hospital discharge in patients treated on it. So this current trial is the first global randomized double-blind placebo phase three trial investigating um, our monoclonal antibody in this setting. So currently it is still ongoing. And our final verdict is still in motion. And then, of course, from Desever, um, the the very popular boy on the block at the moment is from Desever. Now, initially, there had been two randomised clinical trials that compared a 10-day course of remdesivir with placebo. The first trial by Wang and colleagues failed to show any benefit, but recruited only 237 patients, and this study may have been underpowered. A second randomized controlled trial randomized 1,063 patients and found that 
um, those assigned a 10-day course of remdesivir had a recovery time that was shorter by four days compared with the placebo. There was no significant difference found in the mortality um, in between the patients on the drug and those on the placebo. So they did a third randomized control trial. Um, I think it was published on the 21st of August. Um, the effect of remdesivir versus standard care on clinical status at 11 days in patients with moderate COVID-19. And in this third randomized controlled trial, that included 584 patients with moderate COVID-19. The day 11 clinical status distribution measured on a seven point ordinal scale was significantly better than those randomized to a five day course of remdesivir compared with those randomized to standard care. The difference for those randomized to a 10 day course um, compared with standard care was not significantly different. Now, the big problem with this third randomized control trial was the optimal patient population was unclear, the optimal duration of therapy was unclear, and the effect on discrete clinical outcomes was unclear. Also, the relative effect of the drug, if given in the presence of dexamethasone or other corticosteroids, were unclear. So some of the randomized control findings suggested remdesivir could improve recovery for many millions of individuals around the world who may be hospitalized with COVID-19. However, the cost to produce and distribute remdesivir at such a scale are considerable and, most importantly, whether remdesivir offers incremental benefit over corticosteroids, which are widely available and inexpensive, is still unknown. It is therefore uh, or it therefore seems prudent to urgently conduct further investigations of remdesivir in a large-scale randomized controlled trial designed to address the residual uncertainties and inform us basically on the optimal use of it. On colchicine, um, the Greco-19 randomized clinical trial basically is a randomized clinical trial of 105 patients. Uh, the rate of the primary clinical endpoint or clinical deterioration was higher in the control group than in the colchicine group. And the time to clinical deterioration was shorter in the control group than in the colchicine arm. Um, there was no difference observed in the primary biochemical endpoint, but patients in the colchicine group had a smaller increase in the dimerized plasma fragment D compared with patients in the control group. The hypothesis generating findings of this study suggested a role of colchicine in the treatment of patients with COVID-19. So, we would then suggest home treatment for symptomatic patients, vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, nicotinic acid, and paracetamol. So just a quick word about the, uh, other ongoing trials um, for home treatment for symptomatic patients. Currently, there are a few trials on quercerin, a plant flavanol, on melatonin, which is also being proposed as a potential adjuvant treatment for COVID-19. It is suggested that serious COVID-19 cases are marked by an excessive inflammatory and immune response, leading to a cytokine storm. An article published online in March suggested that melatonin had demonstrated anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, and immunomodulatory effects, all of which could have benefited in COVID-19 infected patients. Aspirin also has anti-inflammatory, antithrombotic, and antiviral effects. And famotidine, an H2 receptor antagonist, has been suggested as a potential adjuvant therapy for patients infected with COVID-19. So this is just the buzzing of the bees still going on. Also, another study currently in um, motion is a study on omega-3 fatty acids um, and their antiviral properties. So just to mention that. Now, a quick word on hydrochloroquine. Uh, in August this year, uh, finally, a uh, Systemic review and meta-analysis was performed on the effect of hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin on the mortality of COVID-19 patients. The initial search yielded 
839 articles. The meta-analysis included 11,932 participants for the hydroxychloroquine group and 8,081 for the hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin group. And uh, basically, hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin was associated with an increased mortality. So that hopefully, uh, you know, ends our argument with hydroxy once and for all. Also, please note that inhaled but, uh, budesonide um, is not recommended for our patients. So in the early symptomatic or the viral phase, inhaled corticosteroids may increase viral replication. An open safety analysis demonstrated a higher risk of death in our COPD and asthmatic patients using high dose inhaled corticosteroids. The role of inhaled corticosteroids in the pulmonary phase is unclear as patients require systemic corticosteroids to dampen the cytokine storm with inhaled corticosteroids having little systemic effects. So, the EVMS Critical Care COVID-19 Management Protocol was developed by the Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine of Eastern Virginia Medical School. This protocol for critical care patients was last updated yesterday on September the 2nd and includes the use of IV methylprednisolone, high-dose IV vitamin C, IV thiamine, and low molecular weight heparin. Also, they included statin, zinc, vitamin D, famotidine, melatonin, and magnesium. So their math model, cons uh, please note this is now uh, the math model um, speaking. So they state that notwithstanding the particularly important and impressive results of the, of the recovery trial, um, they prefer methylprednisolone as the corticosteroid of choice for the pulmonary phase of COVID-19. This is based on their pharmacokinetic data that they feel that methylprednisolone has better lung penetration, genomic data specified for SARS-CoV-2, and a long track record of successful use in inflammatory lung diseases. So they um, prefer methylprednisolone um, you know, or they feel it's superior to dexamethasone. Currently at Whitbank, we are using dexamethasone for our pulmonary phase. We also for inpatients use vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, thiamine, enoxaparin for all our inpatients. And I would suggest to consider increasing the dose to one milligrams BD, one milligram per kilo twice, you know, twice a day for those with higher D dimer or an increasing D-dimer results. We also give colchicine. And um, like I said, the model study suggests methylprednisolone. Well, we prefer dexamethasone. Of note, a falling saturation and the requirement for supplemental oxygen should be a trigger to start anti-inflammatory treatment. Um, also note that the combination of steroids and vitamin C is essential. Both have powerful synergistic anti-inflammatory actions. Vitamin C protects the endothelium from oxidative injury, and vitamin C also increases the expression of interferon alpha, while corticosteroids alone will decrease the expression of the important protein. It should be noted that when corticosteroids are used in the pulmonary phase, um, they do not appear to increase uh, viral shedding or decrease the production of type specific antibodies. Also note that early termination of ascorbic acid or vitamin C and corticosteroids will likely result in a rebound effect with clinical deterioration. Just a, a quick note on ongoing trials for patients that are um, um, currently in motion is just a few buzzwords is quercetin um, melatonin, famotidine, omega-3 fatty acids, remdesivir, there's another trial going on at the moment, a trial for magnesium and a trial for atorvastatin for our inpatients. That's all. Thank you very much, colleagues. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taros, for such quite an informative uh, discussion. Colleagues, you can realize from the presentation that uh, either you're a physician, surgeon, orthopod, ONG, pediatrician, nurse, or a pharmacist, or any form of healthcare workers, treatment of COVID-19, it's imper imperative to all of us to note. 
of importance that we can pick up is the use of um, chloroquine and antibiotics. There tend to be an overuse, and I think uh, HPCSA has sent a strong message to not abuse that. We have seen from the presentation and the studies that there is no benefit. Only 3% of adult patients who had COVID-19 had a superimposed infection from the presentation. So we need to really be careful to stop treating ourselves, but patients, you know. And um, of important is the non-pharmaceutical use of uh, vitamin C anticoagulant uh, in treatment of COVID-19. I hope you captured that. And um, my question to Dr. Ross, which I think Dr. Roberts will answer it, with what they are using in Whitbank Hospital in the COVID ward, the combination of things that she has shown us, is it working or not? Uh, my next speaker is Dr. Nageto. Without any further ado, due to time constraint, Dr. Nageto is a renal physician who's going to share us his experience with um, COVID in uh, 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 renal diseases or renal impairment with COVID uh, diseases. Dr. Nageto, you can please share your slides. Hi, good evening, colleagues. Uh, good um, evening. We can see your slides. You may proceed. Thank you. All right, sure. Um, mine is a brief uh, task, I guess, uh, you know, just to discuss uh, how COVID uh, involves these two bean shaped organs. Um, in uh, Wuhan, um, the one uh, municipal corporation reported um, cluster cases of a viral pneumonia on the 31st of December, just a brief background, uh, in 2019. And uh, South Africa declared its first case, uh, I think it was, not, it was on the 5th of March um, this year, if I'm not mistaken. And the WHO declared COVID uh, pandemic on the 11th of March um, this year. And I think what we all have noted is that uh, this clinical disease uh, is quite heterogeneous. Uh, with some patients uh, asymptomatic and others displaying very mild uh, symptoms and others displaying uh, potentially life-threatening um, symptomatology. And uh, just a word on uh, the pathogenesis um, of this uh, disease. Um, for cell entry, the virus uses a spike protein uh, to bind to an extracellular domain on the human ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, there's a high expression of uh, this ACE2 in the upper and the lower um, airways, and that explains um, this uh, tropism um, to the respiratory system. But uh, also the kidneys, uh, they also, um, have got a high expression of the ACE2 um, receptors, and predominantly they are found on the proximal uh, tubular cells as well as the podocytes. And uh, an interaction between angiotensin II overactivity, as well as the uh, innate and uh, adaptive uh, immune and complement pathways and coagulation system, um, these factors influence the severity of the kidney injury. So innate immunity and uh, coagulation pathways are intricately linked. And uh, the COVID-19 associated uh, macrophage activation, uh, cytokine storm, and the release of uh, the pathogen associated molecular patterns, the so-called PEMS, as well as uh, um, damage associated uh, molecular proteins, the so-called DEMPS, uh, result in a release of tissue factor, activation of the coagulation uh, factors, and these predispose to hypercoagulability. And these also can affect uh, the kidneys adversely. Um, the next uh, slide there with uh, those fancy drawings, um, basically targeting the ACE2 by this uh, COVID results in uh, angiotensin dysregulation, as well as innate and adaptive uh, immune system um, activation, hypercoagulation, and uh, those factors result in organ injury, 
uh, acute kidney injury associated with COVID-19. Um, so just a few um, um, factors that uh, also influence acute kidney injury. Uh, acute um, interstitial uh, inflammation, um, acute tubular necrosis, podocytopathy, microangiopathy, as well as uh, a collapsing glomerulopathy on um, um, biopsy. And there's also this complex uh, organ uh, um, crosstalk between the injured lungs, the heart, and uh, the kidney. That also influences uh, the acute kidney injury. Uh, and the next slide just shows uh, briefly that the virus enters, um, it binds and enters the kidney cells, and there's local complement activation and inflammatory response. And the other factors include drug-related nephropathy of the antiviral compounds, poor blood oxygenation, and plummeting blood pressure, as well as a systemic cytokine storm. Um, so we've seen a lot of patients admitted with acute kidney injury, and uh, there's been reports that uh, the incident goes up to 30%, especially in the critically ill patients who get admitted to critical care units uh, with the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is usually in patients with significant underlying comorbidities, especially where the control is not uh, optimal. And uh, acute kidney injury in these patients is associated with uh, very high mortality rates, um, especially in patients where you've had to intervene with dialysis, um, renal replacement therapy. Um, urine findings are quite interesting. Um, proteinuria has been observed during COVID uh, infection, and uh, its presence is reported uh, in about seven studies, and it goes up to 63% um, of the cases. Mild and uh, nephrotic range proteinuria um, has been observed. And uh, Cheng et al. reported hematuria in 26.7%. Um, percent uh, of the patients that uh, he's seen. And interestingly, the histopathology, uh, I must say in our center, we haven't done any um, kidney biopsies as yet. I think uh, we have a lot of technicalities and I think it's, it's, it's not an easy one. Um, but they've noted the diffuse proximal tubular injury with cytoplasmic uh, vacuoles uh, on light microscope and viral particles on electron microscope in the cytoplasm of the renal proximal tubular epithelium and in the porocytes. And they've also noted in some post-mortem findings a diffuse erythrocyte aggregation and obstruction um, of the lumen of the glomerulus as well as uh, pericubular capillaries, but uh, without platelets. And uh, I think uh, to summarize um, intervention for these patients with acute kidney injury, many guidelines really lack uh, or they do not address um, um, intervention in patients with kidney failure. Rather, you know, all other systems have been addressed. Um, but except for this uh, particular guideline from England, where it was published that uh, we still use standard uh, dialysis uh, modalities. Um, so that would include uh, the continuous extracorporeal, extracorporeal uh, renal replacement therapy. So there are examples of CVVHD, um, CVVHDF, as well as uh, inter, in, in intermittent uh, renal replacement therapy. And uh, there we're talking about uh, SLED, or the standard intermittent uh, hemodialysis, as well as uh, peritoneal dialysis, and that is uh, chronic ambulatory PD as well as APD. And uh, then the intervention would include all the other um, therapeutic options that uh, the doctor has just discussed. Uh, I think I will end here, um, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nagato, for such an overview.
Often than not, we, we are posed with a challenge with uh, patients that present to our COVID ward who had uh, pre-renal failure or kidney failure before, and then they end up having COVID. Or those that uh, develop COVID and later on, in the process of COVID, they develop renal failure, either acute or chronic. Um, I feel because of time, we need to revisit it and uh, have an overview of what's happening in the kidneys because uh, some of the patients they succumb to this uh, kidney disease. I know you were limited to time. You could not give us a full overview of this, but thank you. Uh, it's just a stimulator and eye opener to most of us as physicians uh, and surgeons uh, to know that a kidney failure can be caused by either COVID itself or a problem that the patient had a pre-renal failure before. Without any further ado, I'll call upon again Dr. Ross, who's going to give us a non-pharmaceutical treatment of COVID-19, which uh, most people they use at home uh, will hear from her. Dr. Ross. Yes, Dr. Ross, you can go through. Uh, no, it's a wrong one. Can you put the one of non-pharmaceutical treatment, please? Okay, sorry, Doc, one moment. My screen froze. Apologies. Um, struggling, uh, frozen while, still. While you're still preparing it uh, due to time, uh, Dr. Roberts, can you also prepare, prepare your two slides? so that we can run into questions and answers. I've got already a lot of questions on the chats and then on my private phone. So if you can give us the done for pharmaceutical, people want to hear about Mkhonyan and Lingana, and I think Dr. Nagato will come back again to tell us the effects of Lingana uh, on, on, on the kidneys and uh, its uh, use or benefit if there is any. All right, thank you. You can run through it. You've got five minutes to go through it. Thank you. Uh, please unmute your mic, Dr. Ross. We can hear you. Hey, there Thank we go. You. Please run through. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick word on traditional medicine that is used in COVID-19. On April 20th, the Madagascar president, uh, President Andrew Rajulina, announced the launch of the prom promised cure for COVID-19 to his nearly 100,000 Twitter followers. He declared that COVID organics improved traditional remedy that is basically um, a combination of autismia and endemic plants is curative and preventative against COVID-19. Now, autismia, um, or a better known as African wormwood, um, also known as lenyane, or lenyana is, is commonly used by our traditional healers and in households to treat a wide range of ailments from menstrual cramps and gastrointestinal disorders to respiratory symptoms and asthma. The medical use of this um, autismia herb became popular after the president of Madagascar said that autismia is among the herbs being used in his country to cure COVID-19. The drink COVID organics was developed and it's derived from what's similar, like we said, and this is an anti-malaria ingredient. And other medicinal herbs, um, also in combination, which they don't even name <laughs> on the production of this bottle. Now, this sounded like a miracle solution. It, um, it, according to him, could cure and prevent coronavirus. But his claims about the efficiency of the drink remain unproved, and COVID organics has fallen short when it comes to preventing the coronavirus from taking hold on Madagascar. The country has racked up 14,000 cases and 173 deaths after a surge during July. The drink has already been widely distributed in Madagascar, including to school children. African News reported in May that 250 liters of COVID organics were distributed daily and that some Madagascar people basically lined up every day to get some of their COVID organics. So the COVID organics drink has also been either ordered or delivered to other African countries, um, countries including Tanzania, Liberia, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, 
Guinea, etc., and even more recently to the United Arab Emirates. Now, there's no data currently assessing the COVID organic safety and effectiveness nor has any data been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Experts have also warned of risks from using untested medicines like COVID organics, particularly because the drink contains other compounds that, has, that may have side effects. The WHO acknowledges that the quantity and quality of safety and efficiency um, of uh, efficacy data on traditional medicines are far from sufficient to meet the criteria needed to support their use. The reasons for the lack of data include inadequate healthcare policies and a lack of accepted research methodology for evaluating these traditional medicines. So the safety of Otisomia afro is poorly documented despite its long history as a food additive convulsions, dermatitis, and renal failure have been reported. Now, two pamphlets were issued to me last week by a Dr. Tina. One promised to bring back a lost lover and to win the lotto, and the other advertised autosomia, treating everything from crypt malaria all the way through to diabetes. Up to date, though, I have never seen an endocrinologist or a physician boiling a pot in casualties and preparing a drink of lenyana for a recess. So, just a quick touch on other non-traditional um, medications that are being used out there. A video recommending those infected with coronavirus to use hot water, orange peel, and a vapor rub containing menthol to kill bacteria and release all the toxins got over 1.6 million views on the video sharing site TikTok before it was um, removed and hidden. Um, it had already been reposted by a popular Instagram account where it was viewed a further one million times before it was permanently removed. Social media treatment myths escalated to such a degree that the WHO had to step in and provide educational posters. An example here is the WHO explaining that although pepper is very tasty in, in our food, it is not a preventative or curative measure in COVID-19 management. Say so here is um, another example of a WHO poster. So social media treatment myths escalated to such a degree again with honey, ginger, garlic, or turmeric being used as a curative or and or preventative measure of COVID-19. So all these social media myths have kept the poor WHO very busy during this time. Now, my take home message on taking medication that has no proof or benefit is that the potential danger that some of these medications may have. For example, here, a certain American president suggested in April 2020, um, or basically <laughs> he had some comments on consuming or injecting disinfectants. More than 700 people have died in Iran from methanol toxicity this year between March and July after ingesting toxic methanol, erroneously thinking that it can cure the new coronavirus. So let's be safe and we stay with what is proven. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. I think the take on is what you've just said lately, that let's be safe and let's take what has been proven. As healthcare workers, we practice what you call evidence-based medicine. You know, I don't want to say that president's name. <laughs> Without any further ado, I think Dr. Nageto will elaborate later in question and answer, what is the actual effect of this Mkhonyane on the kidneys? Because uh, we know of healthcare workers who are taking Mkhonyane. Dr. Uh, Roberts, please share your last slides and then we go to question and answers. Dr. Roberts will be giving us a brief overview of what has been happening in Wheat Bank in their COVID ward. She's been working there for three months and she's part of the task team and advisory committee to the province as to whether their combination of the medication they're using is working or not. Dr. Roberts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sekole. So I would just like to say a few words about how we have managed to improve our mortality rate um, and the success we've had in our COVID ward because of this COVID regimen we've been using. And we've attributed our success largely to two things. The first being the COVID regimen discussed by Dr. Ross earlier, 
And then the second thing being that we have a dedicated team of doctors and nursing staff allocated to the COVID ward only. Um, and these doctors um, include five MOs and one glorious consultant. So uh, here's some statistics from July and August. So um, with August, from the 1st of August, we officially implemented this COVID regimen um, when we all started in the ward. So the July statistics, um, there was no specific regimen allocated to our ward. So you can see here um, from in July, we had 44 mortalities, which equated to about 36% of the patients admitted to the ward. And then in August, this dropped significantly to 23.5% with our um, treatment regimen that we've been using. Of these, you can see that um, three quarters of the mortalities um, are patients with comorbidities. And a great significant portion of these are people with diabetes and hypertension. When just looking at our mortalities, you can see from July, about 50% of those people um, were over the age of 60. Whereas with our COVID regimen, we've managed to change those factors significantly, where 75% of our mortality are patients over the age of 60, with no deaths in patients um, under the age of 50. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roberts. We can seriously see a significant change and difference in the, in the, in the improvement and the treatment that you guys have advocated for us. Um, I think this is an eye opener for colleagues, physicians, everyone who are in the line of treating uh, COVID. This is a very positive outcome and it's very encouraging. Like I've said before, the lockdowns might be done, but the COVID-19 is not done. It's an acute disease that will stay with us for quite a long time. So colleagues, let's share this information. And I urge you, uh, Dr. Robert, Dr. Ross, and Dr. Zwani, to, to look into this very effectively and also do a study or research on this so that it can be published and for a better use, not only in the province, but hopefully worldwide to see that your regimen or your combination, it, it does work. Without any further ado, I'll ask for a comment from Dr. Mawela and we'll start taking hands. I've got a few questions uh, that I have uh, in, my, in the chats and private WhatsApp. If there's anyone with a burning question, can you please start raising your hands? We are left with uh, 10 minutes in the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mawela, while people are raising hands. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Segula. I think the lineup today um, was quite um, informative. Um, all the sessions, um, you know, and uh, also Dr. Ross on the last session, I think we might need to go through those um, specific slides um, again. Um, I just wanted to, maybe from my side, is just to uh, um, respond to an earlier question already, which was asked, um, specifically whether HIV, you know, is protective or not. Um, against um, um, COVID-19. Um, and I just want to confirm that there's a work which was done in the Western Cape, which was also published in the recent International AIDS Conference. And uh, they presented that they actually, uh, when you compare HIV positive patients and HIV negative clients, uh, positive patients were twice more likely uh, to succumb um, to COVID-19 and especially if um, they had other comorbidities um, and also the history of uh, having TB. So even if they didn't have current TB when they, were, uh, when they were infected with COVID, just previous history was sufficient enough to, to increase um, 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 mortality. And the other thing is that we saw that with uh, HIV, we saw deaths you know, from the young uh, population and uh, in the Western Cape report, but also in our province, um, HIV um, infected uh, patients contributed to about 8% um, eight, eight of all um, COVID uh, related deaths. And uh, obviously, if the viral load is high, more than 1,000 or a CD4 count of less than 200, those two markers were associated uh, with significant risk um, and mortality. And interesting enough, uh, patients who were taking um, tenofovir, 
uh, specifically, um, when the analysis was done, it showed some protective uh, uh, benefit. However, the mechanisms um, surrounding how that works um, are not known um, as it stands. So it's very important that um, in the South African context, remember we have uh, over 7 million uh, people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, we have to um, timely identify those who are living with the disease, uh, put them on ARVs uh, and ensure that um, they are suppressed. Yeah, I just wanted to make that comment. And maybe from a question point of view, I know that uh, Dr. Rose, in terms of uh, your, your, your steroids and the treatment, most of the studies opted to give prednisolone um, in pregnancy versus uh, dexamethasone. So I wanted to check if there was any specific um, reason uh, for that. But otherwise, one welcomes the, the presentations and they were very informative. Thanks, Dr. Skule. Thank you. Thank you for such input, Dr. Mawela. Um, Dr. Ross, do you have any idea about the steroids in pregnancy or we'll wait for the obstetrics when they are presenting in two weeks? <laughs> um, I've seen uh, from the beginning, uh, we've been using the Johannesburg guidelines. Um, here in Pumalanga, our OBS and Ghanis have been using their guidelines. And since day one, they've been using, using methylpred instead of DEXA uh, mm -hmm. for our pregnant patients. Uh, whether this is uh, due to Johannesburg preferring methylprednisolone to DEXA, I'm not sure because as we said now, this meta-analysis procured yesterday did say that DEXA and hydrocortisone is the superior steroid. Um, then again, the the other um, model that I showed you from America, again, prefers methylprednisolone. So I think it, it'll basically be us choosing our favorite child, you know, between these three steroids. That'll be actually quite interesting. The tricky thing is the ethical considerations on testing steroids in pregnant females. That's, that's going to be tough, you know, but I would be very, very, it's, this is an exciting topic, um, Dr. Sikole. Thank you, Thank you for Maybe the Guyanese will enlighten us. Yeah, I just yeah. Have a few, few private questions that have been asked and on, one on the charts. While you are still, uh, before I ask Dr. Nageto, while you are still on the floor, Dr. Ross, there was a question by uh, Mr. Malisar Alitsualo. Mr. Malisar Alitsualo, all protocol observed, and uh, uh, Erika Boshoff about uh, prophylactic use of vitamin K and uh, vitamin mm -hmm. C. He, he reports that there are minors that take vitamin K every day prophylactically to prevent COVID-19. What is your take on that? Um, for prophylaxis, uh, there is still extremely limited data, but there has been a cocktail suggested for people that um, to prophylactically protect themselves against COVID. This cocktail is an expensive safe and it's widely available. And this cocktail is vitamin C 500 milligrams twice a day, vitamin D3 200 to four, uh, sorry, 2000 to 4000 units per day, zinc 50 to, 70, uh, 50 to 75 milligrams daily. And then melatonin is now the new buzzword for prophylaxis. To begin with 0 0.3 milligrams and then increase it to two milligrams nocte. Um, with vitamin K, I am not that up to date with, I know I've read one study that was done in April where they uh, gave patients vitamin D3 with vitamin K2. Um, I do know that um, if, I'm, I'm not sure if vitamin K is currently suggested as a treatment for COVID-19, but I do know that a low vitamin K status has been seen in patients um, basically showing a, a much poor prognosis. So the lower the vitamin K level, the more, um, you know, the the worse the prognosis of the patients. Um, but I'm going to have to go dig and read a bit for you about vitamin K2. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully okay. we get an update on that. Yeah. There's a hand, uh, Dr. Trevor Mukwena, who's a dermatologist. Uh, I saw your hands up. Do you have a question, Dr. Mukwena? Uh, good day. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, can thank you, we can hear you. Thank you very much. And thank you for such uh, informative presentations. And esteemed colleagues, <laughs> mine, mine is just a, a quick comment on ivermectin. There's been a study published by the Australians uh, July this year by the use for the use of ivermectin. As you all know, ivermectin is uh, FDA approved for parasitic infection. 
and has been scientifically shown that it can um, stop or inhibit replication of COVID-19 between 24 and 72 hours. But of note is that these are one observational studies. Currently, there are uh, about 16 phase three trials um, on this ivermectin, and um, we know that uh, it is an inhibitor of COVID-19 uh, with a single dose for up to a thousand-fold reduction of viral replication uh, of a virus within 42 hours in, in cell culture. And secondly, the point that also Dr. Mabella mentioned there for HIV is that we also know that ivermectin has been also shown scientifically to inhibit uh, in vitro uh, uh, replication or uh, HIV replication uh, import of, of the virus. Mm. So it is a promising, still studies are ongoing. So ivermectin may also be, as Dr. Rose has said, under one of the investigated drugs for use and treatment thereof. Thank you, colleagues. Mm. Dr. Segole, unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much for such contribution, Dr. Mukwena. These are kind of inputs that we need. So like I've said, COVID-19 changes every day. So up until we find the right regimen, let's keep on investigating. Let's keep on doing research. You know, thank you. We really appreciate. Uh, a question to Dr. Robert or Dr. Ross. Dr. Mudir is asking, looking at the risk factors for death in COVID-19, what comes high is hypertension. What is the relation of hypertension and COVID? Is there anyone with the answer? Or oh, Dr. Mawela, you know? It's a question from Dr. Mudiri. I, I, I wouldn't know. I'm not a physician. Dr. Roberts? Dr. Rose there. Dr. Rose? I don't know if there is a specific correlation, but a large portion of our uh, patients that are admitted are patients with comorbidities in the elderly. So generally with the elderly comes hypertension. So, but I don't know if there's a specific correlation with COVID and hypertension itself, but we have seen a significant correlation between uh, COVID and uncontrolled diabetes. Mm. All right, Dr. Mawela, I've seen Dr. Maeza in the meeting. Thank you. He's a physician in the Pretoria North Sides. Dr. Maeza, have you seen any such cases? Okay. If you are still in the meeting, Dr. Maeza. Um, Dr. Skule, in the meantime, I will just make a comment, just to say that we must remember that the, um, the majority of our patients who pass on are elderly, you know, generally above the age of 60 years, the majority above the age of 40 years, um, generally. And we would expect um, the majority of the elderly patients to have some form of, you know, um, comorbid condition, whether diabetes, hypertension, um, there's an issue of obesity, by the way, as a critical risk factor, asthma, COPD, and, and HIV, as I have, I have explained. If you look at hypertension and diabetes, at least in Bumalanga, they, they have been, I mean, they've contributed to 76% of COVID-related deaths, right? Um, I, I'm not sure whether there's a the direct link between these comorbid conditions and, and, and COVID, or this is a, a confounding factor because of the age profile of people who are likely um, to be sick um, at that point in time. Um, however, we would know that if you are diabetic, you do tend to have a weaker um, immune system, which then, you know, one might progress quicker to complications and so on. Yeah, that's my only comment um, that I can make. Thanks. All right, Dr. Um, Dr. Moel, thank you. thank you so much. Hello? Um, Doc, thank if you. I may. All right, Dr. Ross? If I may uh, also contribute to Dr. Moela's comment, uh, the link between hypertension, diabetes, and SARS-CoV-2 is also the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So ACE2 is expressed on our lungs, intestines, kidneys, and blood vessel epithelial cells. And it's one of the co-receptors for the SARS, the SARS-CoV-2 uses to infect us. So levels of ACE2 are higher in diabetes and hypertensive patients compared to healthier individuals. Um, so researchers then um, 
basically have the hypothesis that high levels of ACE2 that are observed in diabetes and hypertensive patients then facilitate increased viral entry and replication leading to severe disease. Oh, thank you. That will make sense then. So much, Dr. Uh, another question, Dr. Nagato, are you still here? Dr. Nagato? Okay, I'll just throw it to the panel. Uh, there's a question uh, regarding the use of, uh, what is this? Is Dr. Tabamu Hoshi is asking, uh, since that there is so many healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers who are still using umklonyani despite the recommendation that it not, should not be used up until proven. What are the effects of umklonyani on kidneys? Dr. Nagato? He's not here. Dr. Ross, do you know, or Dr. Robert, Dr. Mawela? Effects of mkhanyani on kidneys. Um, uh, in the two documents that I could see, Doc, is that a high dosage of clean, um, um, clean, well, I struggle to say that, uh, of autosomia, of wormwood, can cause renal impairment, like I said, as well as a dermatitis and even convulsions. Um, there's no specified dosage currently um, out there to say how much you should take of this traditional medicine. And I think if you are scared and desperate and you take a large amount, I think that can lead to renal impairments. But I think our nephrologist here might be able to <laughs> contribute a bit more um, on this. Yeah, it looks like we seem to have lost him. Dr. Oh. Nagato, are you still here? No, I don't think he's here, Dr. Skole. All right, uh, I, I don't see any further hands unless if you can see them, Dr. Mawela. Let's, let's ask two important questions. The first one, right. is there a cure for COVID? As simple as it is, we have seen a lot of graphs and scientific this and that. Uh, Dr. Ross, uh, the panel, what's your take? Is there a cure? I mean, at the end, we have to answer the question, right? As lousy as it sounds, but it's an important question. <laughs> and it's the title for today. That is, that is true, Doc. Yeah, unfortunately, as up to date, there is currently no cure for COVID-19. Yeah. Our, our biggest prayer and hope currently is vaccines. Vaccines, vaccines. Mm -hmm. That is the, the, the hope and prayer we have in medicine at the moment. Yes, yes. And uh, my other question, which I have for you specifically, Dr. Rose, because you are also in the pharmaceutical space, What's your, your comment around uh, medicines that are needed to save lives, um, which seem to be um, overpriced? I mean, the interpretation from the public is uh, that these medicines are overpriced. Obviously, from the manufacturer, people would want to, to maximize profits. And I'm referring specifically to the issue of uh, remdesivir. If you consider the underlying reason why it is not part of the South African guidelines, it's not necessarily because of weak evidence. You know, there's some level of evidence that it might work there and there, but the cost, it costs almost 10,000 rands to get um, 10 doses. What's your, your, your views as a, as a public health advocate? <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Ross. <laughs> um, I think there is no cost uh, for a human life uh, in, but um, on the other hand, remdesivir at the moment, like I said, there are these three. Uh... Oh, I think we lost. <laughs> I'm sure it's as calm. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a last one uh, before we close the meeting. I see we have run over time. From uh, Mr. Farias Mohan, he says, "Can the following suggestion be investigated for immunocompromised patients? Vitamin B, or vitamin C, vitamin B12, thiamine, calcium gluconate, and ringus lactate. We'll certainly uh, have a have a look in that. 
And uh, Tatsuyu says, what is the role of oestrogen in COVID-19? This had a vasodilatory effect. Um, I think that one, we'll talk about it when uh, we've got Ops and Gaini in, in two weeks. And uh, Dr. Ross has just apologized. Lord shedding in with bank. Uh, yeah. Colleagues, thank you so much for attending. My panelists, thank you so much. I think this was an eye-opener. Just like the psychosocial effects we had last week, I think we need to revisit, especially the non-pharmaceutical uh, treatment of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the answer to the question that we have asked before is still says that there isn't any cure. Without any further ado, thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Uh, Dr. Mawela will enlighten us what's happening next week. Thank you. Bye. Yes, um, thank you, colleagues. Just to say thank you again um, to the panel, um, Dr. Sigola, again, for your leadership and for all of us, I think, for participating. Just to say that uh, next week, our topic is the topic on Anastasia and COVID-19. We have uh, Dr. Rachetzi, uh, anesthetist specialist from the private sector, Dr. Mahanyani, uh, who is also an anesthetist in the public sector. Uh, by God's grace, we would have either Prof. Clade or Prof. Madlala, you know, as part of the commentary, you know, we are bringing people with a lot of experience and who also participate as part of the uh, Ministerial Advisory um, Council. So by God's grace, we will uh, manage to, to, to get either of the two professors um, on board. We will share the slides um, via the emails that you have shared. We are also working on an online portal where we would publish guidelines and these um, slides so that you can then be in a position to download them and use them um, as, as needed. We will circulate a new link for these meetings, which would require everyone to register and add your council registration so that we do not have to ask for, for this information via, via the chat. And then I have posted a, a, a request from Whitbank Hospital. They are looking for medical officers, registrars, and specialists. Uh, there's posts that are open. So if you are interested, I have shared Dr. Palani's number on the chat box. Um, have a look at it and hopefully you apply. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Mr. Letalo, would you like to say the closing remarks? Are you still there? our district uh, hospital support uh, director, and then we close the meeting. Thanks, you colleagues. No, no, good evening, and thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Skole, Dr. Mawela, um, and the panelists, Dr. Ross, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Ngageto, um, for the very informative uh, presentation tonight. Um, I'm not taking the, the register, but I, I've seen that tonight we were 84. I don't know yeah. if you have checked, 84 people who registered for tonight. So the numbers are increasing. So it really shows that um, we will be able to reach most of the hospitals. Um, I'm also happy to announce that today we had uh, also people from uh, Herzebande. I circulated the link to the CEO of MLO uh, so that he can give the people in Kherzeban, maybe that's why you see we are increasing in number as well as uh, in Tanzania. So it's no longer an issue of voting Gangala only, but um, people from other districts and uh, other areas are assisting. The decas are really still out, Dr. Mawela. Is there a cure? Uh, it's, it's not it's cure. Out. <laughs> so we can have all the cocktails and everything, but we know that there is no cure. So we need to make sure that we prevent social distancing, mask, sanitizing. Let's continue to do that. So thank we you. thank you. And we believe that even next week, we'll have a good attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Enjoy your evening. God bless you. Bye. And good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.